Hello everyone, and welcome to Introduction to R. In this, our final lesson of this guide, we are going to cover random forest models in the context of classification for the Titanic disaster training data set. And we're going to show how to make random forest models in R. Now, to start off with, we're actually going to talk about what random forests are conceptually. So to do that, I'm going to go over to a whiteboard and just explain and sketch out what random forest models are. So now that we have the whiteboard up, let's see how random forests differ from normal decision trees. So with both types of models, you start with some data set that consists of rows and columns where the columns are your features or variables and the rows are your observations. So let's say this is our data set with several observations and several variables. Now a normal decision tree model is going to take every single variable and every single observation and use all of them to generate the best tree that it can, making splits that increase the accuracy of predictions all along the way. The specific method that a decision tree uses to make its decisions varies depending on the type of tree you're making. There are different ways to choose these splits. That's actually something that you can specify using a lot of different decision tree training models. But the important thing to know is that this tree is grown deterministically and will use every single variable to make its decisions as well as every single observation. Now random forests have a few key differences from a normal decision tree. So for a random forest model, the first part of it is actually the forest part, which is we're growing many different decision trees instead of just a single tree. So with a forest, we have a whole bunch of decision trees and we grow them all. And then at the end, we take them all and do some kind of average over the results that they output. And by averaging together many different trees, we can reduce some of the tendency to overfit the data. Now, the number of trees you actually grow and average together in a random forest model is a hyperparameter that you can choose when you're making the model. It's common to choose somewhere between, say, 500 and 1,000 trees because that usually doesn't take super long to do, and the additional benefit of growing trees beyond that range usually isn't that large. Now, you might be saying to yourself, well, you said decision trees were deterministic, so how do you grow many different trees and average them together and come up with a different result than a single decision tree? Because if each of these many thousand trees were grown deterministically, they would all be a thousand identical trees, and the averaged out result would be the exact same thing as the de first decision tree that we made. That's where the random part of the random forest comes into play. To grow different trees, a random forest model actually only looks at a subset of the observations in each tree that it grows. And generally those subsets are composed of a bootstrapped sample of some proportion of the data. That proportion is often another hyperparameter you can set when you are making the random forest model. And what a bootstrap sample means is you just sample observations with replacement, which means you can end up sampling the same observation twice. So for instance, if we were training a random forest model with 1,000 trees, well, we'd take 1,000 bootstrap samples from this data set. And maybe for each sample, we're only sampling 50% of the data. So in that case, we'd end up only randomly sampling half of these data points. Sometimes they might even be the same data point because with bootstrapping or with replacement. So maybe this observation was sampled three times, but we'll end up with some subset of the data that is only 50% as large as the original data set. And then we would go and grow a tree from that. We'd do that again, we'd take another bootstrap sample, we'd get some different observations, and then, we, then we'd grow the second tree from that sample. So for every 1,000 of these random forest trees we're growing, we have a bootstrap sample that is not likely to be the same as any of the other ones, at least if we have a data set that isn't too small. So that's one part of how random forest models are able to generate many different trees, even though they're based on a deterministic algorithm at the core, which is a decision tree. 
Now there's one other key aspect of the decision trees that random forests grow that make them different than normal decision trees and add to the uniqueness of the different trees that they grow. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So when you're growing a random forest decision tree, it's different because it's not completely deterministic how it's grown like a normal decision tree. That means even if you drew the same bootstrap sample randomly, the ultimate tree that you grow probably won't be the same. And I'll explain why that is. So when you grow a random forest decision tree, not only is it grown from a random bootstrap sample, but at every decision point, you actually don't consider every single variable. You only consider a subset of the variables to split on at all of these different decision points. And since you're considering a random subset of variables to split on, even if the input data is exactly the same, the tree you output is almost certainly going to be different. So for instance, at this first split, we might only consider, say, three to five of the total features we have in our data set up here, even though our data could have hundreds of features. And then at the next split, we'd consider another random three to five features, etc. This random sampling of different variables to choose at each split kind of forces the trees grown by random forests to rely on different aspects of the data that might not be used in the typical deterministic decision tree. So the upshot here is that random forests take this basic tree model, grows many different trees using bootstrap samples, a forest of trees, and then within each of those trees uses some randomness to grow the tree so that each tree is going to be unique even if the data that it happens to draw is pretty much the same. And averaging out the results of many of those trees, essentially an ensemble of many different decision trees, tends to make the model have a bit better predictive performance and also tends to make it a bit more robust against overfitting. So now that we have a conceptual understanding of random forest models, let's see how we can train random forest models in R. So let's go down and first we're going to load in the data set we're going to work with. So we're going to load in the Titanic disaster training data set. We're also going to load in the random forest package that will let us train random forest models. We're going to load in carrot as well because we might be using that. So we'll run this cell just to get everything that we're going to need here. And then to actually build a random forest model, it's going to be a similar construction to the other models we've used in R. If you haven't noticed so far, this is a kind of common construction for defining predictive models in R. We're going to first call the modeling function. So in this case, it's called random forest if you're using the random forest package. And then the next thing is going to be a formula that's specifying the variable you're trying to predict on first, the y. So that's going to be survived. And then the tilde. And everything after the tilde, again, is just going to be the different variables we're going to use for prediction. So for this random forest, we're going to use the sex variable, the passenger class, age, the number of siblings, and the fare the person paid. The next argument, data, is just our data set. This, we called it Titanic train. And n tree is a argument specific to the random forest model. That is going to be the number of trees you're growing that you're going to average together to create the final prediction. And then m try, this argument here, is the number of different randomly chosen variables you choose between at every single branch of all the trees that are grown. So in this case, if we set m try to two, when this random forest model is growing all of its trees, at every single decision point, it will only be choosing between two of these five variables that we included in here. So if we set m try to five, well, it would use all five of them and then it it wouldn't have the randomness of choosing a subset in that case because we would choose all of them. So generally we want to be picking an M try that's less than all of the variables. So we'll choose M try two in this case since we have so few. And then after running this, we'll save it in a variable called RF model. And then we'll just call that to view a summary of the output. So let's run this here. Since we're doing a thousand trees, it might take a little bit of time because that's a thousand different decision trees it's having to train. So as you can see, we get some output here with the model summary. It's showing us how many trees we did, the number of variables tried at each split. That was our M try. And then here it gives us this useful OOB estimate of error rate. 
That is using the out of bag samples. So basically when we're making each tree, some of the data is left out of the sample used to make each tree. So then those samples that are left out can be used to assess the quality of the tree that was grown. And by doing that, you can get an estimate of the actual predictive accuracy of the random forest. So that's a useful way of getting some assessment of how good the random forest is without having to do any kind of extra validation steps. So in this case, it's telling us the out of bag error estimate was about 16.5%. That seems pretty good. And then it also is showing us a confusion matrix. So it's showing us where the model predicted correctly, true negatives, true positives, and then the things that got wrong. So that's quite useful output just for the random forest model summary. We didn't even have to call a confusion matrix function because it comes with one for us. Now, if we wanted to, we could take this model and make predictions on new data and submit it to this competition on Kaggle. So let's show how we would go about doing that. We would load in the train, the test data set the same way that we did with the train data. We'd have to pre-process it the same way. So these are all the same steps, just pre-processing the data. And then after getting the data, the test data, we can make predictions on it by saying predict. We will pass in our random forest model is what we're predicting with. New data is going to be the test data set called Titanic test. And for this competition, we want to choose type equals class because we're predicting the actual class of zero for, I believe, didn't survive and one for survive. And instead of predicted probabilities, that's just what this application calls for. So we'll save those predictions as the test predictions. And then for this competition, we want to save it to a CSV with particular names that it's expecting. So we're going to save it as a data frame first with passenger ID equal to the test set passenger ID. And then the prediction survived equal to our predictions. These are the two column names that this particular competition is expecting. Once we have that data frame, we can just write .csv our data frame. We will save it as this name. So tutorial random forest submission .csv row.names equals false. So by running this, if I run the whole notebook, it will create a submission CSV file that I can use to submit to this competition and actually get some feedback on some unseen test data. So let's run that. I'm not going to go out and do the actual submission right now because I've actually already done it and gotten the answer. So if you do submit these uh, predictions we made with this random forest, it will achieve an accuracy of about 78.4% on the test data. This seems pretty good, although if you were to go submit a simple logistic regression model that only used sex as a predictor, it would achieve a similar level of performance. So in this case, using a more complicated model like random forest isn't really performing any better than the simple logistic baseline model. So in that case, maybe we would prefer to use the simpler model. So that just goes to show you that using a more complex model like random forest, they can provide better predictive performance in some cases, but they aren't without their drawbacks. It's not guaranteed they'll perform better than something simpler, especially if you're working with a smaller data set that doesn't have many features to work with. And random forest models on bigger data sets can take a lot longer than single decision trees or logistic regression or simpler models to train because you have to build so many trees and then average them together. And often it takes a good 500 to 1,000 trees to get good performance out of your random forest. And the model itself can end up taking up a good bit of, bit of memory because you're storing so many trees when you make it. So it can be a good idea to, when you're using random forests on a fairly big data set, start off conservatively and don't grow something too complicated. Maybe start off with a 10 tree forest or something like that that isn't too deep so that you don't end up training something that's going to take really long and kind of judge based on how long that takes to train, how big you should make your model based on how much time you have. Because if you try to just go ahead and do a 1000 tree model right away on a big data set, that could take a really long time that you might not want to have to wait around for. So this is the last lesson in this introduction to our series. In this series, we built up slowly from the most basic rudiments of the R language to building predictive models you can apply to real world data. 
R isn't always the most beginner friendly programming language in the world, but my hope is that you found this to be an accessible and practical introduction to R that allowed you to get started and apply things to real data, even if you didn't have any pre existing knowledge in programming or data science. As a series focused on practical tools, generally geared toward beginners, we didn't always take the time to dig really deep into the details of the language or the statistics behind the various models we covered. But my hope is that this gave you the tools and piqued your interest, equipping you to be able to dig deeper on your own if you want to do that. Now, if you're interested in learning more about R, there are many ways you can do that. I have a lot of other R videos on my channel that aren't a part of this guide. In particular, I have a lot of things about doing various data visualization in R, so you might want to check those out. And also one of the best ways to learn R is to take on projects that you're interested in doing on your own and just do those to learn. One good place you can do that is Kaggle. So if you don't have a particular project in mind, you can always go to Kaggle and look at the various competitions they have or analytics tasks that people are posting and try to tackle some of those as a project. Now I also have a 30 part guide that covers Python for data analytics it essentially covers all the same topics that were covered in this R guide, just in Python. So if you're interested in learning Python, you might want to check that series out. I'll leave a link to the playlist in the description of this video. And as always, thanks for watching and good luck to you wherever your programming and data science journey takes you.